Computer Science 461, Configuration Management, Chapter 25, Saw, Somerville. So, what is configuration management? Configuration management is the development and use of standards and procedures for managing an evolving software system. And you do need to manage this because it's pretty easy to lose track of what changes you've already made to the system. Uh, one, you can end up delivering the wrong system. Two, you could end up losing track of which source code to include. And this is also required for standards such as ISO 9000 and the Capability Maturity Model. Uh, generally, this is considered part of quality management. And if the system is ex of acceptable quality after development, it becomes what's known as controlled systems. And a controlled system requires an agreement on changes before the changes are implemented. That's the uh, basic uh, definition of a controlled system. So why different configurations? Well, you can have configurations that are produced for different customers, different computers, different operating systems, client-specific functions, or application product lines, assembly line type software. So configuration management includes policies, standards, and procedures, and these are discussed in Somerville, and they work pretty well for the waterfall model. Somerville has also defined configuration management for other types of development cycles. Um, for example, the model used with incremental development uses something known as a nightly build type of model. Basically, you build a new version of the system every night. Uh, this does find problems early and it does result in don't break the build mentality. IBM, when I was working there, used this type of um, methodology and there was one young lady who was responsible for putting together all the code and releasing the system. Basically, Nobody on the development team got to go home until she did, and she would get pretty cranky if you had her there past 7 p.m. So um, it does result in, you know, kind of uh, strained relationships sometimes. Uh, agile methods can also have configuration management policies and procedures, but, but the usual attitude is, hey, why bother with that formalism? And uh, sometimes that comes back to bite you. In order to have good configuration management, you need to do some planning for it. So a configuration management plan should describe the standards and procedures that should be used for configuration management. So what should be managed? Who is responsible for what? And that's probably the most important part of your configuration management plan. Defi definition of policies, specification of tools, what is the structure of the database that you will use to keep track of the components and the changes made to them? And what are the auditing policies? So if someone were to come in and look at it and see if you're doing it correctly, what policies do you have in place to ensure that? Item identification. After deciding what it is you want to include, you need to have a consistent identification scheme for those items, for the files you want to include. And those need to have a unique name. Uh, Somerville suggests a hierarchical naming scheme such as the one seen in this uh, figure. This is an example of a hierarchical naming scheme and using this hierarchy each component would have a unique name. So you could have PCL tools, edit form, display, uh, form IO, uh, input version 1. And after you have a unique name, you need to put things into a configuration database or at the very least a spreadsheet. So the configuration database is used to record all the relevant information about configurations and configuration items. It can be used to assess the impact of system changes and also generate reports uh, for management about the process and how things are going. You can also record information about users of components, execution platforms, proposed changes, etc. Uh, Somerville kind of has a humorous uh, approach here that he's uh, written out in pseudocode. Uh, request change by completing change request form. Analyze change request. If change is valid, then assess how change might be implemented. Assess change cost. Submit request to control board. If accepted, then repeat the following. Make changes. The software submit change software for quality approval until the software quality is adequate. Create new system version, and if the change is invalid, request, uh, reject it, and if the change doesn't get accepted, uh, reject it. Um, you probably also need a change request form so that the customers can submit those. And Somerville has an example of a change request form that you can find in Chapter 25. 
more formal view is one that I put together and this was uh, one that we actually used at Ford Motor Company. It's a bit more of a formal process so let's take a look at it. Uh, here what you can see is an overview of the entire process. You can see the swim lanes for who's responsible for each part. So let's take a look at each piece of the puzzle beginning with the individual user making a change request in the upper left. So here the individual user begins by making a request for a change to the system. This is generally for the reason to, sort of, to suit a business purpose or to um, address a system performance need. Next, the um, user group and IT department review the change for viability. The change is either rejected or approved based upon merit and feasibility and they assign a business owner of the change. Financial feasibility is also considered if the change takes hundreds of hours but will only save uh, minutes per year, it typically gets rejected. After the user group and the IT group, or a subset of the IT group look at it, it gets passed to IT assuming it's accepted. And IT analyzes the change request, they create a design document for the change, <coughs> And then they change the, to the requirements. Uh, the changes to the requirements are reviewed with the user group and IT implements the change. After IT implements the change, the testers test the change against the system design document user requirements. And if the change is correct, then it's sent to the IT department who releases the change into the next release of the software. Batching of changes, that is putting them all together into a larger group and releasing perhaps once a week or twice a month is uh, more desirable than ad hoc releases because it keeps the system stable. As part of this, the documentation training experts incorporate the change into system documentation and into the training classes. And then all affected users receive notification of the change to the system, including the original requester of the change. It's important to close the loop on things. So uh, configuration uh, management also has documentation requirements. Basically, if you have a controlled system, you have to have documentation so you know what changed and what's included in each release. So one of these is change request form. This is create, completed by the user and submitted to the user group and IT department. It describes the required change for the system. It should include the following information. Name of the user, date of request, priority of change, usually on a one to five scale, approximate savings and cost benefit to the company, system area, if the system encompasses multiple areas, and a detailed description of the change. After you collect a lot of these change request forms, you want to put them into a summary sheet or a uh, database. And the uh, summary sheet should include the following information, change request number, systems area impact of priority, abbreviation, uh, abbreviated description, requester, date of request, status, and status date, basically indicating what point of the process the change is in. Is it being worked on by systems? Is it uh, being incorporated by training, uh, where is it in that process. Summary sheet should also have the business process owner's name on it. Um, and that was determined as part of the process diagram. The cost, uh, how much does change cost the IT department to uh, develop, and cost savings, this is how much money it will save the company. And then time to realize savings, which is cost savings divided by system cost. Although you can really use any financial feasibility function as we discussed in the Loudon and Loudon lecture. Uh, documentation required, uh, basically is it just online help? You need to update the systems guides, you need to update formal classes, uh, what all needs to be done. So let's look at versioning, system building, and case tool support for configuration management. Version and release management uh, exists to identify and keep track of versions of the systems. And you need procedures to ensure that proper versions of the system are released. So there's a couple different things that uh, crop up with the term version. And Somerville has three different definitions. A 
Version is an instance of a system that differs in some way from other instances. Versions with only small differences are called variants, and it releases a version that is distributed to customers. That's a pretty good set of definitions. Um, where you end up working might have different definitions, or you may uh, change those terms, but this is a pretty decent set of working definitions. So in order to create a version, you need to specify the versions of the system that components that are included in it. For example, if we were making uh, a release of WebSphere at IBM, we might include the WebSphere application server version 4.03, DB2 version 6.2, and WebSphere Commerce server 2.3. You need to have an unambiguous way to identify each component version to ensure that the right ones are included. So three techniques for component version identification. One is version numbering. Component is given an explicit unique number. The other is attribute identification. Each component has a name and a set of attributes that form a unique ID. And then change-oriented identification where you use an attribute identification, but you also associate the component with the change request. This assumes that new versions are created in response to change requests. Let's take a look at all three of these. Uh, version numbering. In a simple scheme, a version number is added to a component or a system scheme. For example, Solaris 4.3, Windows 3.1. Decimals are the versions, whole numbers are a release. Derivation of versions is not necessarily upwards or linear. For example, Windows 1.0, 2.0, 3.0, 3.1, 95, 98, ME, XP, Vista, 7, 8. And, of course, Smart Eiffel took this to another level where they basically started from version minus 1.0 and counted upwards. They're currently at version minus 0.74. And uh, Java is notorious. Uh, Java 1.0, Java 1.1, Java 1.2. Pretty good so far. Then it was Java 2. And then at that point, it um, basically was Java... Uh, 2 Standard Edition, Java 2 Micro Edition, Java 2 Enterprise Edition, uh, and then Java 2 Standard Edition became Java 3 Standard Edition, but instead they did it as Java 2 Standard Edition 1.3, and likewise for 1.4. So it's um, basically, uh, you know, pretty much insanity uh, at some point. So you can use something like Somerville's, and again, the um, the version is the number after the decimal, and the release is the number before the decimal. Attribute-oriented identification for versions, basically you can have a set of attributes, and the combination of attributes is going to be unique. So, for example, we could have my software customer, Don Thomas, platform Windows 8, uh, delivery date 2015, uh, April 15th. And this removes some of the version retrieval problems uh, of simpler version numbering, but you still have to know all the attributes and it can result in pretty long uh, release names. Change-oriented identification. This is similar to um, change-oriented identification for components, but used to identify versions. So each system change that has been implemented has an associated change set that describes the requested changes made to components. Theoretically, you can combine change sets, but sometimes difficult in practice. For example, change set A may be incompatible with change set D. And a system release is a version of the system that's distributed to customers. Not just code. It can also include configuration files, data files, an installer, documentation, of course, packaging and publicity, and uh, be careful about the packaging and publicity. Um, there's a great article from uh, 2009 uh, where they um, released a game for Godfather 2 and uh, basically um, it came with a set of goodies like a cigar, a silk handkerchief, a book of matches, and brass knuckles. So those were some of the publicity items. Um, while it nicely complemented the game's mafioso theme, it also had the unfortunate side effect of turning recipients of the mailing into criminals, as mere possession of brass knuckles is illegal in many states and can carry hefty pen penalties. So they actually had to pull back the release. So be careful about the uh, publicity. 
Problems with releases? Well, customers don't always buy the latest releases or download the latest patches. How many times do you have to uh, get update uh, notices from Java before you uh, actually deal with it? Uh, and you can't assume that the associated files are installed at all sites. Uh, release criterion or release creation. Uh, release creation is the process of creating a collection of files and documentation. It includes all of the components for system release. Uh, basically, um, you need to document uh, to record exactly what files were used to create the release, and this allows it to be recreated or reconstituted if necessary. And uh, in terms of releases, um, it's important to point out uh, particularly uh, Lehman's uh, fifth law, which is uh, an enterprise type system involves all associated with a developer sales personnel must maintain mastery of its content and behavior to achieve a satisfactory evolution. Excessive growth diminishes the mastery, hence the average incremental growth remains invariant as the system evolves. So releases have a certain consistency in how much they change. And some of the factors influencing release strategy, technical quality of the system. If you've significantly updated the quality of it, you will want to release a new version. Uh, platform changes. Uh, if the underlying uh, system evolves, the operating system evolves, you may need to release a new version. Layman's fifth law, which we just talked about, competition. If your competition releases a new version of the system, it may pressure you into making a new version of yours available. Marketing requirements, sometimes marketing will push you to release a new version and customer change proposals. If the uh, customer is demanded, you may have to release a new version as well, particularly for customized systems. Release documentation, you need to document releases so they can be precisely reconstructed in the future. Record specific versions of the source code components. Keep copies of the source code and executable code along with all the data and configuration files. Ideally, archive these so you can reconstitute it easily. And record versions of the OS, libraries, compilers, and other tools you use to build the software. Because sometimes those things will change and cause your new uh, release to break or you can't reconstitute an old version with some of the newer tools. Uh, this is the final piece which involves how you put all the pieces together into a working system and it's called system building. And it's the process of compiling and linking software components into a program that executes on a particular target configuration. So what questions should you ask when you build a system from its components? Well, system building occurred in Somerville uh, requires the system builder, build script, version management system, compilers, and linkers. And putting these together, beginning with the builder, the version management system, going to the compiler and linker will result in an executable system. And to do this, you'll need some case tool support. And configuration management processes are usually standardized in an organization. Now, whichever organization you work for will be unique, or whichever one you're working for now will have its own unique configuration management. And this has had case tool support since the 70s. These are usually combined to create workbenches. Uh, they can either be open, which is a roll your own, put together the different components, different compilers, linkers, um, configuration management tools, or integrated, which are pre-manufactured and they put everything together for you. So what do you need for support for change management? Well, you need some form of editor workflow system. This allows the team to define who must process the change request form and the order of the processing, a database to keep track of those changes, and a change reporting mechanism. So um, support for version management. Um, basically, if you want to take a look at an exemplar tool, uh, CVS is a good tool to look at. Um, software engineering students frequently want me to teach a particular tool or technology for configuration management. While it's a fairly reasonable approach at a polytechnic or an applied college, I feel it's better to you know, cover the general capabilities because whatever organization you end up working for will have its own tool 
and you say, well, gosh, why did you teach me this particular version, because I'm never going to use it. Uh, still, CVS is a fairly good general tool, and you can take a look at it um, as an instructive exemplar if you want to uh, dive into it. General capabilities that version management tools will have. Uh, version and release identification, some form of storage management, change history recording, and the ability to develop multiple versions of the system concurrently. And basically these version management systems will automate the build process to reduce the potential for human error and also minimize the time required for system building. So they'll have a dependency specification language and associated interpreter ability to specify the compiler and other tools including the flags that you want to put into that compiler uh, for that particular build, distributed compilation so you can work on multiple machines at once, and some form of derived object management.